her on the winning strategy for a high GRE score. My name is Dave, and I am a senior tutor here at Example. I'm going to spend the next hour with you guys talking about how to get a high GRE score, what are the main secrets to it. And before we really start this thing, I just want to make sure that I'm not speaking to myself and that everything is working. So if any of you guys could just tell me, there's a chat bubble on the right. Thank you very much, Paige. That's what I wanted to hear. Fantastic. So as I said, my name is Dave. Thank you, Kavya. Great. And now that you guys are familiar with your uh, with the chat function, uh, feel free to use it throughout uh, to ask me questions. Um, if they're related to what I'm talking about, I'll try and address them as we go along. If not, I might tell you to wait till the end of the hour, and then I'll have to talk about it late at that point. But I'll try and get to everything. Thank you also, Onyi Okoye. I hope I said that right. So before we even get started, I just want to tell you guys, thank you for being with us this hour. And we have an offer for you guys just for going to the trouble of logging in and spending this time with us. So for the next 48 hours, we have 25% off any and all of our GRE courses. To take us up on that, go to our website and use this coupon code, GRE Bootcamp 2019. I'm going to repeat it again at the end of the hour. So don't worry about it. So as I said, we're going to be talking about the winning strategy to get a high GRE score. But before we do that, and as way of an introduction, really, I want to talk a little bit for, for about five, six minutes about what ExamPal is and what this has to do with how to get a high GRE score. So are you familiar with the feeling when someone is explaining something to you and you're just not grasping it? And if you are, now prepare, imagine yourself what it's like to prepare for an admission test, such as the GRE, in which there are lots of questions that have lots of different possible solution tools. And what you need to do is find the fastest one. And the thing that we've noticed is that students all over the world are bombarded with lots and lots of practice questions and tips and tricks and, and shticks that are all there to help everybody the same way. And there are a few problems with that. So what are those problems? Well, the first thing is if you're teaching everybody the same way, but there are actually many ways, many possible ways to solve a question, but it's a one-size-fits-all approach which doesn't focus on finding the best way for you because, Paige, maybe you, it's the best for you to solve a question one way, and Kavya, maybe for you, another way is the right way to solve. And what do I mean by that? What different ways are there? Well, stay tuned because that's actually a very big part of what we're going to be talking about for this next hour. But the point I'm making right now is that um, regular brick and mortar courses overlook this and generally teach one way to solve a question. And this also makes them very ineffective in terms of time um, because uh, if we're teaching the same thing to everybody, then we're kind of by definition teaching a lot of stuff that's not relevant to you. We're teaching a lot of stuff that's too easy for you and you're going to find boring. And we may be teaching stuff that's too hard and is out of reach and not very effective. And um, finally, uh, and this is a direct result of the last point, it, it's very, very time consuming to practice this way as well because you're practicing on questions that are too hard, too easy. When really what you want to be doing is practicing on questions that are at your level or a little bit higher to improve. So. Um, that is the background that we grew out of. And we at ExamPal are a course that's founded by uh, tutors that used to work in these types of courses I'm, I'm just describing. And we realized that something was missing. And that's why we founded ExamPal. And ExamPal is a contrast to all of these things. So ExamPal studies the way that you, as an individual student, think. It tries to study, or rather it does study, the effectiveness of all the different possible solution strategies for a question and uses this information on how each one of you solves 
to find the best way to solve each question. And when I say the best way, I mean the best way for you personally. And what this really is all about, if I have to summarize it in one thing, which we're going to be talking about um, in the next 20 minutes to half hour, is a skill which we call cognitive flexibility, which is the ability to change the set of tools that you're using very quickly in order to uh, best fit the data that you're getting at the moment. And this is a really big part of what the test asks us to do. Um, you know, one minute we might be looking at, a, sorry, just a second, one, one minute uh, we might be looking at a bit of algebra, another minute it might be throwing in geometry at us, and then a quick uh, a word problem. And what we work on is not just providing you with the knowledge you need, but, but actually the tools to find the fastest way to solve. So how do we do that? Really fast, I'm going to run through this, but we start with interactive video lessons, which teach you each and every one of the subjects of the course, and we do it in an entertaining way, and also in, by interactive, I mean we're already asking you questions right as we teach it, and already at this point we're studying the way you solve them. And then we move on after the videos, which for each topic, by the way, there are two. There's an introduction, which is just the fundamentals, and then there's a lesson, which is already talking about answer strategies. And after both of these, we move on to the practice. And each practice session starts with a diagnostic phase. And what we found, and this is already kind of really getting into the nitty gritty of what, we are go what we're gonna talk about now, is that even though there are lots of different tools, we can divide these tools into three overall strategies, precise, alternative, and logical. And this is the PAL, this is the PAL in exam PAL. That, that's who we are. So for example, the question that you see on the screen now for every positive x and y, 3x plus 2y divided by x plus y is between. So this can be solved in several different ways. Okay, it can be solved precisely. Okay, by just simplifying the algebraic expression, it can be solved alternatively by using simple numbers to plug in for x and y. It can also be solved logically, simply by uh, figuring out the ratio between the numerator and the denominator. And all the different ways are going to get us to the same answer. And in the diagnostic phase, what we work on is figuring out what tools you like to use. Okay, and then from then on we move to the improvement phase where we focus on getting your level and finding the best questions for you. And at this point, we're already asking you for feedback. If you get it right, what was the tool you used? If you don't get it right, why? What was the main reason for your mistake? And we're incorporating all of that in order to have the system give you questions that are more suited to you and, expl and, and explanations that are more suited to your level and to your strengths and weaknesses. And all this comes to a head in the last part, which we call the optimization phase, where we're here we're really giving you questions and solution strategies that are chosen based on the information we've gathered so far. And for example, what you see on the screen now is an example of a question which there are four possible solutions, but we rate based on a combination of the general user data and your own personal data what we think the best fit is for you. So in this case, it's a first precise solution. So um, in professional terms, what we're called is a open, semi-supervised recommendation system. You don't need to know what that means, but what it means in general is that we don't just do machine learning, we actually do machine teaching. We scan through the ideas of our students in order to find the ones that are best to teach every new student. We do this with over 50,000 students from over 156 countries. We've won lots of awards, as you can see on the screen. Um, we have excellent scores on Trustpilot. And more importantly, I think this should interest you, is we uh, put our money where our mouth, is, our mouth is. That is, we give you a real success guarantee. If you have a previous GRE score, we guarantee you're going to improve it by seven points. Um, so if, if that's the case for you, go to our site, look at the success guarantee and, and um, look at the terms and take us up on it. Um, so that's us. Just to reiterate, we're giving you 
uh, 48 for the next 48 hours, 25% off. And without further ado, let's start talking about how to join the 160 Club. And really, we're going to talk about two tools today, the main tools of how to get this score, which are called cognitive flexibility and rapid improvement. Okay, now, um, just before I get really jump into the nitty gritty of uh, these two tools, let me just say, I'm not saying that after this webinar, each one of you guys is definitely going to get 160, right? Obviously, we all have a different starting point. We all have a different level of English. We all have a different level of math. We all have different strengths and weaknesses, speeds, talents, ambitions, perhaps. What we're really here to do is to make sure that you get the best possible score for you and that you do it very quickly. And we're going to be talking about what you have to do in order to get 160 and also what you definitely shouldn't do. Okay. So, um, so let's start talking about the first tool, which I've already defined. Cognitive flexibility, as I said, is the ability to quickly find the fastest way to solve each question and solve it. And we've also already talked about the three solution tools that all GRE questions fall into, precise, alternative, and logical. So precise means using the most straightforward tool. It's probably the way you're already used to solving questions. Just taking your pen and your paper, taking the information in the question, and solving on your own, getting to the answer on your own, and only when you're done looking up at the answer choices and picking the one you've already gotten to. That's basically what precise means. Alternative means using all kinds of shortcuts. And oftentimes, the shortcuts that you're going to use and, and you're going to get to the answer, and you're not necessarily even going to be sure why this is the answer. You won't be necessarily be able to explain it, but you've gotten to it. And importantly, you probably have gotten to it faster than the precise way would have gotten you. And finally, logical is what it sounds like. It's using logic. And there are a few kind of important logical rules and rules of thumb, which we learn, and we can be use them on many questions. And when this is applicable, it's, it's the fastest, really, because oftentimes we can ignore lots of data and say, it doesn't even matter to calculate this because it has to be bigger than 70, for example, and thus it can only be answer choice D. So that's really what we teach. And you should be asking yourself now, OK, great, when do I use precise, alternative, and logical? When do I use them? So the bad news is, unfortunately, it's not a straightforward answer such as uh, you, know, you use precise for solving triangles, and you use alternative whenever there's a hypotenuse or anything like that. If that were the case, perhaps this webinar would be shorter. But uh, really, the point is that it's, 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 by definition, it's not a one-size-fits-all. The decision of using precise alternative and logical has to be made on a question-by-question -question basis. And the answer is really dependent on two factors, two overall factors. The first is the question's characteristics itself, the question itself. Is there anything about the question that tells you, oh, you know, this looks like there's a lot to calculate and it's going to be easy and, and not likely to get confused so I can use the precise approach or maybe this looks like oh i can just easily plug in a number here or use the figure and and solve this in an alternative way it's going to save me a lot of time or maybe there's some kind of logical cue maybe it's talking about the most or always or never or all kinds of logic words that have logical meaning that i can use to solve um this quickly so this is the kind of questions we have to ask ourselves. And the second thing is our own personal strengths and weaknesses. Because as I said in the beginning, you know, maybe Paige, you are really good at quick calculations, and that's the way to go for you. And it's not worth the time for you to look at other uh, ways of solving. And maybe caveat for you, um, you know, really just using the figure and and cutting it up and seeing what it looks like is really helpful helpful for you. And it's much better than kind of abstract thinking about geometry. Maybe it's the other way around. But the point is, is that this second point is really one that we're only going to be able to answer once we've solved and, and practiced a lot using these three different solution tools. Um, 
to be a little bit more specific, probably for all of you right now, the precise approach is the natural go-to because that's how we've learned how to solve in school, right? Um, and for that reason, it's very valuable to practice the logical and the alternative tools, even if you're later going to you know, revert back to the precise, but you'll know why you're doing it. And that's a big part of, very big part of what we work on in example, working on all three uh, different tools and uh, really figuring out what works for us. So this is kind of the introduction, the end of the introduction, okay? I hope this was clear so far, and if not, you guys uh, ask me something in the chat. And now I'm going to I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm hopefully going to make this a little bit less abstract. So we're going to look at a few questions now and we're going to try and figure out together how the different solution strategies are applicable. So let's look at this question to start off. Of the 900 guests that attended a wedding, 36% were women. If 450 men left the wedding, the women would be what percentage of the remaining guests. So take another five seconds just to look at the question. And I'm only giving you five seconds because now I want you to answer a summary. How should we solve this quantitative question? Should we use precise? Should we use alternative? Or should we use logical? Or maybe you don't know. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute, Dave, I didn't really have enough time to figure it out, and you're already asking me to figure out, to tell you what the solution tool, that's the point. Because we don't have time to solve things, start solving them, and then halfway through say, oh, actually, a logical tool would have been the way to go here. These different solution tools are ones we have to make, not a split second, but, but a, not very far from that, a pretty quick decision within maybe 15, 20 seconds how we're going to solve this question. And a big part of getting good at the GRE is figuring it out in an efficient way. What's the way for me to solve? So I'm just going to run through them really quick, precise, um, just solving it on our, on our own, straightforward with calculations, alternative, using all kinds of shortcuts like plugging in a number or estimating, and logical, using some kind of logical cue. And I'm going to wrap up the votes and I'm going to share them with you. So you should be seeing them on your screen. Interesting, all of the uh, all of the different choices got some votes, but the clear majority for precise. And this is not surprising to me that most of you guys are saying precise, because as I said, first of all, precise is, is natural to a lot of us. And second of all, precise is almost always possible, okay? Especially, you know, we have a calculator. There's very little we can't actually do with precise. And this question is no exception. We can solve it with a precise way. How is that going to look? Well, we, by the way, I'm going to do this pretty quickly. If you can't follow, don't worry about it. At the end of this uh, webinar, we're going to upload the video. You'll have time to watch it at your leisure, pause it, you know, enjoy my voice, however you want to do it. Um, the point now is less for you to really follow along and necessarily solve the question, but more to, to, to focus on what I'm saying and about the points I have to make about different solution tools. So I'm just going to do this rather quickly, if that's OK. So how do we solve this? OK, 900 guests, 36% of women are, are women. Sorry, 36% of 900 is 36 over 100 times 900 which is we can simplify the 900 by 100, turn that into 9, so 36 times 9. How, what is that? I don't know, but let's do 36 times 10 minus 1, and that's 360 minus 36, which gives us 324. Obviously, with the calculator, it would be even faster, but okay. 36 of 900, 324, we're only halfway through. Now what do we do? Well, 450 men left the wedding, so that's 900 minus 450 which is 450, leaving the w remaining women to be, well, they haven't, the number of women hasn't changed because only men left. So the remaining women are 324 out of a total population of guests of 450. 324 over 450 is, we can simplify by three, get 36, and in the end, we're going to get to 72%. So that's the way to solve it with precise. 
Notice though, that was kind of a lot of work. And even if we use a calculator, still a few different stages to do here, right? At least three separate calculations. And obviously we have to make sure we don't get anything confused in all these calculations. So again, precise possible. Is it the best way? I'm not sure. So let's look at a different way to solve this one. We're going to look at the logical approach. So if we have 900 guests attended a wedding, 36% were women, and then 450 men left the wedding, women didn't leave at all. So what does this mean? Well, remember, percentage means part out of a whole, right? It's it can be presented as a fraction. And in this case, we're asked about the percentage of women out of all of the guests. Now, to start off, this percentage is 36%. And now we're asked about a situation in which the guests become half, but the women remain the same, right? No women left. So the numerator remains exactly the same, same number of women. And the denominator is now half of what it once was. So if we're dividing the denominator by half, that's the same as multiplying the entire fraction by two. Meaning if we were 36% before, we're 72% now. And now look kind of up at the screen and look what we had to do. No calculations basically, or 36 times two is really the only calculation. Just kind of using pure logic, we got straight to the answer. We had to do far less calculations. I think we even had less room for confusion, probably. Um, and yeah, and that's it. And this is a good example of a lot of the why the logical uh, approach can be very, very useful sometimes. And indeed, by the way, this is a question we've, we've measured. And people using the precise approach have gotten it right a lot of time, but it's taken them on average two and a half minutes. Whereas people using the logical approach is taking them less than two minutes. And just to refresh your memories, we have to be on an average pace of two minutes in the quantitative section. So this is literally the difference between being at a pace where we don't want to be and being at a pace which is a-okay, which is fine. So was that clear, guys? Tell me, tell me if it was, or ask me questions about it if it if it was not. Um, but um, I'd like to hear just to make sure we're all on the same page before I move on to the next question or questions. Okay, thank you, Onyi. Thank you, Paige. Yes, logic is much easier in this in this case, right? Um, just to be clear. Thank you, Ricardo. I'm not saying the point of this webinar is not logic is the way to go, and it's not alternative is the way to go. It's rather these different approaches are all relevant, and sometimes um, sometimes different ones are the best. And plus, sometimes sometimes the best ones are best for different people, right? Even in this last question, I concede for some of you, the logical approach might be confusing. You might have gotten it wrong. You might have, instead of uh, multiplying by two, you might have divided by two and gotten to 18, perhaps, and maybe the precise approach, you just, you're a whiz, you do things really quickly. For some of you, maybe it would have been better. On average, I'm saying it's not the case, but that's exactly the point, that we have to combine um, kind of the general knowledge of what's good and the much more specific knowledge of what's good for me. Um, and that's what we help you do on ExamPal because we're all the time measuring how everyone does the question and how you are solving it. Uh, specifically, Kavya is asking, how do we figure out a logical way fast enough? Um, so I'm not sure I understand the question. If you're asking, how do we figure out how to use logic fast enough? So it's not an automatic thing, right? Part of these, there are logical tools which we need to learn. And, and in our course, we do learn them. We, we talk about, say, for here, here for example, there's a, there's a logical rule that has to do with what happens when part of a fraction changes and the other part doesn't change. What happens when the denominator is divided? That means, oh, that means you multiply the entire thing by the same thing that it's divided by, for example. So no one is saying this has to come naturally to you, or and if, and if not, then that's not the way to go. There's a lot to study. Um, 
but at the same time it at the same time it is true that a logical approach at a certain point is something that you have to have um some intuition for because otherwise you know it might just take you too long for it to come to you but really the bottom line of what I'm saying is it's something we need to learn, learn a few fundamentals, try practicing it a lot, see logical solutions, and um, if they work for you, and in the end get to a conclusion of whether these tools work for you or not. So uh, feel free to keep asking me, but I want to keep chugging along. We're going to look at another quantitative question and think how we want to solve it. So two printers run simultaneously. An inkjet, an inkjet printer that prints at a uniform rate of 80 pages every 15 minutes and a laser printer that prints 100 pages every 10 minutes. How many minutes will it take for them to print 230 pages? So I had so much fun last time. I think I'm going to do uh, the same um, survey again. I'm going to give you guys less time to solve because I because you already have practice on it. But how do you think we should solve this question? And I'm on purpose not giving you more time to look at the question because that's the point, right? We have to make really quick decisions. So, okay, I see a majority of you have already voted, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, last seconds if any of you want to. And this is interesting, very evenly divided. Perhaps as a result of last time, a small plurality has moved over to logical. One of you guys is very uh, honest and, say, and says, I can't tell, which I, I admire. And, uh, oh, also precise is tied with logical. So interesting anyway, but, uh, but a big uh, mix. So again, we're going to do this pretty quickly, but let's see. Um, let's see how we can solve this question. So once again, Precise is possible here. I'm not going to show it to you, but you're welcome to do it at home and see how long it takes you. In fact, I, I recommend you to do that later. But um, for now, take it on faith that precise is possible. But I want to show you guys that in this case, actually, alternative, which interestingly, not many of you voted for, alternative has a lot of potential. So how does that look like? So an alternative, we can use the power of estimation. And we can say, OK, or well, actually, sorry, not, not estimation, or rather not only estimation, we can say instead of figuring out on our own how many minutes it'll take and then looking at answer choices A, B, C, D, E and hoping that what we got is the same as one of them, let's just use these answer choices. We know it, there's not an infinite number of possible solutions. There are only five. We know it's one of them. So let's just try them out and see if they work. So starting with A, um, because... It's a very easy number to work with, 10. So let's say what happens if it took 10 minutes, for example. So if it took 10 minutes, we already, um, so we know what happens with the laser printer, right? Um, let's start with the inkjet printer. So if the inkjet printer prints 80 every 15 minutes, so 10 minutes is 2 thirds of 15. So 2 thirds of 80 is, I'm not sure how much it is, right? It might be, just off the top of my head, it's not such an easy calculation, but here's another alternative tool we can use. We don't have to necessarily calculate everything. We can we can estimate. So two thirds of 80 is definitely gonna be between 50 and 60, right? We can agree on that. Again, obviously with a calculator, you can do this exactly, but it's even that not necessarily always worth our time. And printer two, we know exactly how much it is, right? 100 pages every 10 minutes, we're told that. So all in all, we're gonna have between 150, 160 pages, nowhere near 230, right? And this is why it's not necessary to make a precise calculation because it doesn't matter exactly what it is. We know it's not close to 230. So we can rule out A and we can we can know that it has to be something larger than A. But how much larger, right? If we have to go from 160 to 230, that's about one and a half times larger. So looking at the answer choices, we have 30, which is three times as much as A, and 20, which is two times as much as A. And it seems obvious that both of these answer choices are going to give us way more than 230 pages, right? They're going to more than multiply the 160 or so pages. And for that reason, we can rule these out without even trying them. And we're left with only two answer choices, uh, 15 and 18, B and C. So let's try B. Again, mostly because it's easier 
than 18. And, and we, if we eliminate that, we'll be able to do, choose 18 without actually going to the trouble of calculating it, which is um, an improvement. So 15 minutes. So the inkjet printer, again, we know exactly how much it is. It's exactly 80 pages. We're told that. And the laser printer, this time there's no need to estimate. It's a very easy calculation. If we do 100 every 10 minutes, we're going to do 150 every 15 minutes. So 80 plus 150, 230, exactly that's our answer. Answer choice B. Again, was precise possible here? It was possible. Was logical possible here? Probably. We could have done some kind of uh, estimation <clears throat> based on the properties of these inkjet printers. But here, just plugging in the answers, pretty efficient way to solve. Um, I, I think you'll agree. Right? I hope you'll agree. So that was kind of a quick look at three of the answer tools in action in the quantitative, the precise, alternative, and logical, even though the precise, we haven't seen an example where precise is the way to go. We saw an example where precise is maybe not the way to go. But um, I hope at least you're convinced that these three tools um, are applicable. And now let's look at an example of a verbal question to show you guys that it's not only with numbers that these tools are applicable, which may be a little bit counterintuitive, to be honest. But um, let's do that again. I'm just going to break for a second before I do. If you guys have any questions, do feel free. I'm here to answer them. Um, but if not, we're going to move along, and we're going to look at a text completion question. Although the law greatly hindered the ability to smoke in public, it was not the main reason that cigarette sales blank during that year. Rather, shifts in public perception wherein smoking came increasingly to be seen less as a blank and more as a blank drove this trend. So once again, let's kind of think just for a second how we would solve this one. I realize this is harder to do because I haven't really even spoken about what these different answer tools um, mean in verbal, but really they mean in general the same types of things. Precise is using the information that's in the text in order to solve the text. Logical is using some kind of logical um, verbal uh, principles such as sentence structure, cause and effect, all types of things which we go into obviously in far more detail in the course. An alternative generally means using the answer choices, starting from them and not from the question, and trying to eliminate, use the process of elimination, and figure it out from there. So interesting. Um, very clear majority among you guys for uh, logical, although some votes for the other approaches as well. And let's go back to the question and look at it. To be honest, I think they're probably um, even more than in the ones we've seen before, I think there are probably a few answer tools which not only are possible but are are fine here. But um, just because we haven't yet seen an example of where precise works, I want to show you guys an example of how we can solve this one in a straightforward, precise way in the verbal. So in the verbal, again, precise means just using the information in the question to try and figure out the answer more or less on our own. Um, so let's start doing that. Although the law greatly hindered the ability to smoke in public, it was not the main reason that cigarette sales. So what does it mean, not the main reason? It doesn't mean it's not a reason. It means it's not the main reason. So not the main reason, a, a more uh, straightforward way, at least for what we care about to say that is, it was a reason, right? If it was not the main reason, it, it was still a reason. So it was, so. Let's, uh, let's review it again. Although the law hindered the ability to smoke in public, it was a reason that cigarettes, that cigarette sales something um, that year. So, okay, so if the law hindered the ability to smoke in public, okay, it hindered the ability to smoke in public, and this, this hindrance, this obstacle that it posed to smoke in public caused it to be a reason that cigarette sales what? Well, if something hinders something, we would expect it to make that thing happen less, right? And if that's the case, then we know 
without even looking at the at the cells, we know that in blank one we're looking for some kind of synonym of something that is less, some kind of decrease. And now looking at the answer choices, surged, plummeted, and fluctuated. So the clear choice, if we if we know our vocabulary, of course, is plummeted, right? Plummeted means decreased. It means decreased sharply or heavily. Okay? So although the law greatly hindered the ability of smoking in public, it was not the main reason that cigarette sales plummeted during that year. Let's keep going. Rather, okay, so, so this is already... This indicates some kind of contrast, right? The rather shifts in public perception, wherein smoking can increasingly be seen less as a blank and more as a blank, drove this trend. So we have here a big clause in the middle of the sentence, wherein smoking something, 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 which can make it a little bit clunky to read, especially when we have two blanks inside of it. So let's ignore that just for a second. Shifts in public perception drove this trend. What is this trend? We already know from the first sentence, this trend is the trend of cigarette sales plummeting. So shifts in public perception drove the trend of cigarette smells, cigarette sales, sorry, plummeting. Okay, so if 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 the shifts made us people buy less cigarette sales, then wherein smoking came increasingly to be seen less as A and more as A has to must have to do with this result. So if the public perception caused a drop in cigarette sales, that must mean that it made smoking seem less as a good thing and more as a bad thing. Again, I don't know exactly what these answers are going to be. This, the precise approach is not is not that and not accurate to that level, but I know a lot. I've already figured out that blank two is going to be some kind of word with a negative connotation, and blank three is going to be some kind of word with a positive connotation. And now, lifting our eyes up from our scratch pad and looking at the answer choices, we can see that a negative connotation in blank two, sorry, the opposite, because it's less of, so it's less of a good thing. So a positive connotation in blank two would be a luxury, and a negative connotation, which we have more of in blank three, would be a vice. Right, so it's seen less as a luxury and more as a vice, and that's it. We all we have our answer here. Although the law greatly hindered the ability to smoke in public, it was not the main reason that cigarette sales plummeted during that year. Rather, shifts in public perception, wherein the smoking came increasingly to be seen less as a luxury and more as a vice, drove this trend. So this is an example of using the precise approach in the verbal section. Again, it would have been possible to use the alternative approach. We would have kind of worked the opposite from what we did. We would have looked at surged, plummeted, and fluctuated, tried to plug them into the answer, see if it makes sense on its own. If two or more would have made sense, we would have had to keep going and then kind of look at the other answer choices to see if they worked in them. In this case, I think it would have actually worked rather effectively. Sometimes when we have a few blanks, it can get kind of complex because you can have sort of many different options. But anyway, um, so this kind of wraps up the first part of our webinar, the main part, but the first part, which is about cognitive flexibility. I hope this was clear. Um, you're welcome to ask me anything and everything about it. And um, I'm going to move on now because remember we talked about, we said there are two different tools that we're going to talk about, about <clears throat> what 160 scorers do. So the second tool, aside from cognitive flexibility, we call rapid improvement, okay? And looking now on the graph on your screen, we call this um, the plateau effect. So what does that mean? Well, this um, is something that we see happening a lot to a lot of students. Um, and what you and what you see here is that at the beginning of their studies right uh the beginning of the time their studies they're improving very rapidly the results are going up all the time and then it slows down a bit and then it basically stops uh, granted this is a bit of an extreme uh display right i'm not saying it, it actually stops but for many people it becomes a very very slow incline after a while. 
and they can keep solving and keep solving and just not get much better. And the thing is, is that actually this makes a lot of sense, okay? You can think of the GRE part of our brain, if you will, as sort of a muscle, right? We, we definitely, when we start working out, we definitely improve it and it's, it can be quite exciting. But it does at the same point have a limit, right? We all have a certain natural speed we can read at. We have a natural calculation ability. And it's not that we can't improve those things. We can, but at a certain point, it gets kind of hard. And at this point, once we already learned all the material and we know kind of the basic tricks, at this point, improvement becomes harder. And crossing this plateau is something that 160 scorers know how to do, and it's what sets them apart from GRE students who are merely good and not very good. So how? How do you do this? What, what do you need to do in order to cross this plateau? So here are a few tips um, on how to keep improving once you've already done most of your studies and most of your improvement. So the first thing has to do with research and implementation. Okay. And this mostly has to do not with when you get things right and everything is uh, hunky-dory, but rather when you get things wrong. And of course, none of us like the situation. None of us like to get questions wrong. But and, and that's fine, but what we shouldn't do is just brush our mistakes aside and keep moving until we get the next one right, even though it might be natural for us to kind of want to do that. Um, and what a good improver does is he can treat his mistakes as opportunities. And after each mistakes, each mistake, sorry, you should ask yourself, what was this mistake about? Why did I get it wrong? Was it a professional issue? That is, did I just not know the material here? Did I forget how to do, you know, the Pythagoras theorem and did I just mix it up? And if so, it can be maybe a bit of a bummer, but actually this is uh, very straightforward. We have to go back to the material. So, for example, I'll go back to the intro video and, and study it again. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. But was it a technical thing? And, and this, these are the technical... Mistakes are the ones where once we look at the answer, we say to ourselves kind of like, oh, that doesn't count. I, I knew that one. I just, I'm just, you know, I was kind of an idiot, so I got, I got confused, but it's not a real mistake. And these are the ones that it's really the most natural to kind of brush aside. And these are the ones where you shouldn't. <laughs> um, because sometimes these ones can have the simplest solutions. Sometimes it can be a, just a totally technical and kind of dumb thing which can help you avoid um, the, the mistake. Again, it can be something as simple as writing down A, B, C, D, E on your scratch pad and scratching them out one by one so that in the end you have one left and you don't pick the wrong one. Something simple like that or redoing your calculations or doing everything in the calculator twice. Um, all kinds of stuff. But the point is once you see a silly mistake that happens twice, it happens more than once, that means there's uh, an opportunity for improvement here. If you figure out how to solve this silly, annoying mistake. And finally, maybe your problem was strategic. Maybe you did everything right. Maybe you even got the answer right, but say you wasted a lot of time. And this has the most this has to do with the PAL approach, because maybe you're solving it with the wrong answer strategy. Maybe you're going precise when you should go alternative. Maybe you're going alternative when you should be going logical, and so on and so forth. And this is a thing which is it's worth to ask yourself for each specific question. And in example, we give you solutions after you do them. So if, it's, if we show you one which is different than the way you solved, it's very straightforward to compare, right? Compare your solution to ours. See which one would take more less time. See which one you think was easier for you. And even if we show you the same approach um, that, that you chose, you can still think to yourself, wait a minute, were other solution tools possible here? And again, the goal here isn't to relitigate how to solve this specific question you've gotten wrong. The goal is to gauge some kind of uh, tip or uh, insight 
that is more widely applicable. And this is what you should write down after all this process. You say to yourself something like, oh, I've now realized that in questions that have, for example, a variable in both the question choice and in the answer, so it's both a question, sorry, and in the answer choices, in these cases, it's worthwhile for me to plug in numbers instead of the variables and solve that way and not solve any other way. And that's the kind of thing you can really then implement and and um, and see if it follow and you and see if if it helps you improve. And implementation is really the next point. You should after you get to these conclusions, you should seek out similar questions, and you can do that um, by going back to the practice um, um, on ExamPal, or you can go to the official guide, and that's another way to do it. And really, any way you want, you can go out and search for and find um, more questions to work on. So a few other tips are, and these ones are perhaps a little bit more um, kind of do with lifestyle, but a few other tips that I, that I think are important for your rapid improvement. Um, they have to, some of them have to do with just having a good um, study uh, environment. So I really, I recommend finding a quiet and um, friend, friendly place to, to work at, you know, whether it's, you know, on campus or in your home, if you're the kind of person who can work at home without getting up every five minutes to look at the refrigerator. If you are, maybe get out of the house and go to a coffee shop or something like that. Um, maybe get a study buddy. It's very, even if it's not studying the same thing as you, but someone who's working hard, it can be useful to have. Um, uh, that can help. Another point is even when you're really studying very hard, I do recommend taking a day off. I do recommend taking time uh, to exercise. It's, it's worth it. It'll make you feel better the rest of the time. I highly recommend sleeping well, sleeping eight hours a night every night, definitely before the test, but not only while you're uh, working. And, um, and I recommend when you're studying to be to make the most of the time you're studying. You should be totally focused. If you're studying on your computer with ExamPal, then that's great. It means only one tab should be open on your browser, and that's ExamPal. Your cell phone should be probably in another room entirely, and it shouldn't disturb you. And um, all of these things can help your app improvement as well as implementing um, learning from your mistakes. Finally, let's just go over really quickly what we think a study plan, um, an ideal study plan should look like. We have an entire other webinar about how to build a study plan. A lot goes into it, but obviously in far less detail now, this is an overview uh, of what the ideal study plan should look like. So between six to eight weeks and a total of 120 hours overall, okay? So 120 hours over six to eight weeks, do the math. Um, it's actually not that many hours per day or per week, but you can spread that out any way you want. Um, if you have a full-time job, it's possible you can do it working in the evenings and on the weekend. If you don't have a full-time job, you can do it uh, just working full days and perhaps do it even a little bit quicker, although we don't recommend actually doing less than six, to eight, doing less than six weeks. Let's, let's say that. And this breaks down into uh, 20 hours of going over our intro videos, 20 hours of going over our lesson videos where we talk about the PAL system, 30 hours of the practice system of studying, of practicing the questions. In the end, before you take a test, of 30 hours of taking um, practice tests, the official um, power prep uh, GRE practice tests, another 20 hours of working on your verbal skills. Now, if you're not a native English speaker and you need to work on your native on your English skills, then add another 30 hours on top of that. So 150 hours in total, and these should be gone towards improving your verbal abilities. So 50 hours of that. Um, and just to break it down a little bit more, so if we're looking at a 60-day, um, two-month plan, so the first 50 days should be devoted to studying the material, which on Example means just following the course trail and giving for every topic. So here you see uh, on the screen, I guess it's hard to see, but um, anyway, giving each topic um, two days. 
So um, on the first day, you learn the material, you go over the intro, and you go over the lesson. On the second day, you practice. You use the our practice system. And also, while you're doing this, at the same time, give yourself an hour, at least a day, to work on your verbal skills, reading and also going over uh, verbal material. And after all of this, in the last 10 days, that's when you want to work on your review and your practice tests. So the way I recommend doing it is every, say, even day, take a practice test and then ask, spend the rest of the day analyzing it, what went well, what didn't go well, what I need to work on, and then spend the, rest, the next day uh, reviewing, both maybe working on the topic that the practice test showed you used to work on and just going over anything you've seen in the, in the first 50 days that you've said to yourself, I really should go over this again. So this is the time to do it. Um, <clears throat> as I already mentioned, I recommend keeping an error log where we uh, document mistakes, and more importantly, what are our conclusions from them, and always ask ourselves uh, you, um, when you make a mistake, <clears throat> What happens if I see a similar kind of question again? What is the conclusion I'm going to have about how I should approach it? Finally, take a day off before the test. You've earned it. And move on to crush the GRE test. So we are basically at the end or nearing. We're nearing our end. We've talked about using cognitive flexibility. We've talked about using rapid improvement. We've even talked about a study plan. And you guys have been great. And I want to, again, as a token of our appreciation, offer you guys 25% off any of our GRE courses for the next 48 hours to take us up on this. Go to example.com. And when you go to check out, use this coupon code and you'll get the discount. So I hope you do take us up on that and we see you on example. And really, that's what I have to share with you guys today. Um, so I'm going to stop talking. And if you guys have any questions you want to ask me, um, we still have a few more minutes. I'm more than happy to answer them. So hit me with what you have. And for those of you that don't, um, really thank you for being with me this hour. And I hope to see you an example. If you do go there, even before you sign up, even before you do anything, you can always, there's a chat bu bubble on the bottom right edge of the screen. You can go there right now and you can send a message. And if it has to do with material or something, maybe I'll answer it. And I'll be happy to see you guys there. Say the webinar sent me. And, um, and then I'll know. Um, great. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Um, how much is our GRE example? Oni asks, surprisingly cheap, but um, we have a few different types of courses. Um, so just I just recommend go to example.com, go to our pricing page, and you'll see our different options. And then everything that you see there, take off another 25% because that's the price we're offering you. Mara asks, what is the best way to improve on reading comprehension questions? Use the PAL. So yes, and, and not only also. So as I mentioned, it's just important to work on our verbal skills on their own as a separate kind of muscle we have to hone. So we recommend reading every day, 45 minutes an hour a day, just reading. Um, and I'll say a little bit more than that. Just don't just read passively, but try while you're reading to practice what we work, what we call active reading. So just really get, get kind of be conscious of the fact that every paragraph in good writing has its own idea. Every paragraph transmits an idea. And be constantly asking yourself, what is this paragraph about? Okay, I can tell from the first sentence, what is this paragraph about? What else what am I what else is going to be in this in this paragraph? Oh, this is an example. This is how does this strengthen the main point of the paragraph? Oh, it strengthens it because blah 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 blah. And keep really practicing asking yourself these questions and, and improve on your reading in that way. So that's one part of it. And the second part of it, um, yeah, yeah, you 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 practice solving questions and you do use the palette it is applicable there as well. Um, we can use each of the approaches in different types of, of methods. And, and, and we, obviously, this is something we work on in the reading comprehension section.
of the GRE. Um, Mackenzie Turner, thank you. Um, nice to meet you. Hope to see you again. Uh, Tamara asks, reading anything for an hour to an hour and a half? Basically, yeah, but uh, no, to be more specific, we recommend reading something with good English. Um, maybe, maybe something that's connected to something academic, let's put it that way, or something that's connected to a topic um, that's in the, that's either like economics or business or science. Um, and hopefully something that interests you so you won't just be bored. But um, yeah, I recommend reading the news, but like from a good source. So the New York Times or The Economist or um, something like that, The Washington Post. Um, or books, I recommend more like nonfiction um, because that's the type of prose that you're going to find in the GRE. And the rest of the time, I don't recommend just reading an hour, an hour and a half. I recommend part of the time reading and part of the time working on <clears throat> your vocabulary. We have just lists of hundreds and hundreds of words and, and you need to work on them because the GRE expects a very high vocabulary level. So it requires practice. Any other questions, you guys? Uh, last call. Well, all right then. Um, once again, thank you guys very much. Um, your questions were interesting and this was great. Uh, I'm gonna turn my microphone off. Um, I'll stay logged on just for another two minutes in case any of you think of something else you wanna ask. But for now, signing off, nice to meet you guys and hope to see you in a future webinar or to see you on exampal.com. Have a good one, guys.